Welcome to part two of my lecture series on relaxation in CFD. This part of the lecture series is going to build on the ideas that we looked at in part one of the lecture series, where we looked at explicit relaxation in CFD. And now in part two, in this video, we're going to move on to look at implicit relaxation in CFD. This talk is going to be particularly useful for you if you're an open foam user or if you're naturally curious about CFD and you've wondered what's the difference between the relaxation of field values and the relaxation of equations in CFD. This talk is going to provide you exactly with the information you need and I know you're going to find it extremely useful. So let's jump right into the talk. So before we start talking about implicit relaxation, let's do a quick recap of explicit relaxation that we looked at in the previous talk. And you'll remember from part one that the case we were using as an example was 1D steady state heat conduction in a bar. And we were solving this problem with an iterative solver. And so what that means is that the solution changes during every iteration. And as the solution converges, we eventually reach that final steady state solution. And what I was doing, the example I used was just looking at the temperature variation in cell two in the bar with each iteration as the solver converges. And if you were to plot this on a graph, it may look something like this. Each iteration, the temperature in the cell changes until we reach that converged solution where the temperature is no longer changing. And you'll remember that during each iteration, what we do is we solve the matrix equation, uh, which is given there in the box, and the solution of that matrix equation, the temperature vector, T1, T2, T3, and T4, gives the temperature at the centroids of each of those cells in the bar for the next iteration. And in our case, we're looking at cell two, so the solution T2, that will be the next value that would appear with the point monitor in the plot that we were doing. Now, you'll also recall that when we apply explicit relaxation, what we do is we calculate the update to the solution that that calculated value of T2 or T calc would have given us. We calculate the update, which is the dashed line. And then what we do is we apply some fraction of that update to give us the actual solution that we use in that iteration of the solver. And the fraction of the update that we actually apply is given the notation alpha and is often referred to as the relaxation factor or the under relaxation factor. And the effect that alpha has primarily is that the smaller the value of alpha, the smaller the difference between successive solutions of the CFD solver when we're using an iterative solution method. And the problem with this approach is what happens if the matrix equation itself, AT equals B, what happens if this equation is unstable and we can't find a solution to this equation for some reason? What that means is that if we can't find a solution, we can't calculate T calc up here. And that means because we can't calculate the update to the solution, we can't then apply a fraction of that to calculate the actual update to the solution, which is given in equation two here. So we needed T calc to be able to update the solution. And if we can't calculate T calc, then we can't apply relaxation in the first place. And the way we get around this is by using implicit relaxation rather than explicit relaxation. And that's gonna be the focus of this talk. So the main idea behind implicit relaxation is to apply the relax relaxation to the matrix equation itself rather than the update to the solution. So we're applying it first rather than solving the matrix equation and then relaxing the update, we're gonna apply the relaxation directly to the matrix equation. And there are a number of ways you could do this, but I'm going to illustrate it using the same example we've been using for this entire lecture series uh, of the four by four matrix equation for the temperature distribution in the bar. We've got AT equals B there. And what this matrix equation physically represents, of course, is each row of the matrix actually represents conservation of energy for a particular cell in the mesh. So the second row here, 
actually represents conservation of energy for cell number two, and the other rows in the matrix what represent conservation of energy for the other cells in the mesh. So altogether, the matrix equation represents conservation of energy for all of the cells in the mesh. And if you want to know where this matrix equation comes from and what the various coefficients A21, A22, B2 actually mean, uh, I go through that in a bit more detail in the residuals in CFD talks. So you can always go back and watch that one if you want a quick uh, refresher for how we calculate this. But roughly speaking, where the equation comes from is if you think of cell two there in the bar, then you would have heat coming in or out of the left face of the bar. That would be Ka delta x t1 minus t2 from Fourier's law. And then you'd also have uh, heat passing out of the right face of the bar. That'd be Ka over delta x t3 minus t2, again with Fourier's law. And then you may have some source of heat within the bar as well. And you can kind of see that by rearranging that equation, you'd get a linear equation um, in terms of the temperatures, T1, T2, T3, and then some leftover term for B2 on the right-hand side. So that's just a quick recap. Each row in the matrix represents conservation of energy, and the matrix is really a collection of all of those equations written together. And the way I'm going to illustrate implicit relaxation and how you can derive it, it's easier to look at the equation for each of those rows of the matrix individually rather than the entire matrix itself. So what we're going to do is just extract one of the rows, uh, apply implicit relaxation and then build back up to the matrix form again because it's a lot easier to understand. So if I just go ahead and extract the second row from the matrix equation, so that's one of the four equations that the matrix uh, collects together. We've got A21 T1 plus A22 T2 plus A23 T3 plus A24 T4. Again, that's just matrix multiplication. And the temperature that we actually want is T2. So what I'm going to do is just do a bit of rearranging and uh, remove that term A22 T2 and bring it to the front and collect all of the other terms together on the left hand side. And what we're going to do for convenience is to just collect these terms together using summation notation. And many of you may have seen this form of the equations uh, before in CFD, where we use this form to isolate that term which contains T2 at the front and then just collect all the other terms together in the summation. And then we have B2 for the right hand side there. And even though I've chosen to use cell two here, you could have chosen to use any of the other cells in the mesh. And for that reason, it's often convenient to use the more general form of the formula, which is APTP. So we're making this general for cell P rather than cell two, just changing the notation, and then BP on the right hand side rather than B2. So this is, this is just the same equation that we had before. All we've done is extracted that second row of the matrix, which is just conservation of energy for a given cell in the mesh. And what we're going to do to derive the implicit relaxation formula for this cell is to, to, just to divide both sides of the equation by AP, where for cell two, AP represents A22. It's that diagonal coefficient on the A matrix. It's just a, it's a single value, so we can divide both sides of the equation by AP. And we arrive at equation eight. So we've done a bit of mathematical manipulation, but what have we actually done here? What we've actually done is we've isolated the single equation in that matrix equation that gives us the calculated temperature, T calc, that we would apply uh, in uh, cell T2 if we weren't applying any relaxation. So this is the T calc value here, because of course, if we'd solved the matrix equation, we would have calculated T -T TP or T2, and that's the value we would have applied here. And then normally when we were using explicit relaxation, we would have taken the update and applied a fraction of it to give us the updated temperature. And now that we've got this equation for TP or T calc, we can now apply implicit relaxation to this formula and then uh, directly relax the calculation rather than relaxing the update. So just to give you a bit of a uh, graphical representation of what the difference is between the explicit and the implicit relaxation, I've got them both for you here on the slide. On the left hand side, we've got explicit relaxation, which we looked at in the previous talk, where if just to remind you what we do is we calculate T calc by solving the matrix equation or just by looking at that single row in the matrix. And then we take that update and we apply a fraction of it 
And so instead of moving along the dotted line, we actually move along the red line and arrive here. That's explicit relaxation. But what we're doing here is we're actually changing the value of t calc itself. We're moving that calculated value down. So actually what we're doing is we're just changing the dashed line so that we go directly to the calculated value that's got relaxation already applied to it. And you'll notice that we actually end up in the same place if we use the same relaxation factor. That's the idea. But the benefit of using this implicit relaxation approach is that if the matrix equation itself is unstable, we're able to stabilize it. So going back to the maths, how do we do this? Well, we have our formula for T calc or TP in this case, and we've got a relaxation formula. This was the explicit relaxation formula. And what we're going to do is just substitute that whole equation in for T calc, because that is an equation for T calc. And when we do that, we arrive at equation nine. And this looks a bit messy. We've got quite a few terms here. What, what are we going to do now? How are we going to simplify that equation even more? Well, the trick is to remember what this equation actually means. The left hand side, T here, this is the actual value that we use after we've applied all our relaxation. This is actually the value that's reported back to the user on the screen. If you had your, your plot monitor or if you had a contour or if you looked at the solution at this time, T, this is the solution that we would have. This is what is being given to the user. And what we're doing with the implicit relaxation, you'll remember just from that graphical sketch, that what we're actually doing is we're moving that dotted line down directly so that the, the calculated value TP actually gives us the value of t directly. So with implicit relaxation, the trick to moving on with the derivation is to set t equal to tp. So that value that we're gonna be giving back to the user is exactly tp, which is the calculated value. So we substitute that in there. And now what we need to do is just do a bit of rearranging. We've got a few terms here and they look a bit messy. Let's just rearrange them and move things around. And the easiest way to do that is to start from equation 11 and then multiply both sides of the formula by uh, AP over alpha. And you'll see we've got the AP over alpha there, multiplied by all the terms. And if you sort out the brackets, you'll see that you get AP times T old, where T old, if you'll remember, that was the value from the previous iteration that we, we uh, calculated last time. And then if you just rearrange these terms together, you arrive at the form of the equation here in equation 13. Now, this looks a little bit messy. There's a lot of terms here and we could get a bit lost and not be too sure about what the terms in the equation actually mean. But actually, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we can actually start to see what's actually happened to that equation when we apply the implicit relaxation. And so just as a reminder, the original value, so before we applied the relaxation and we extracted that second row of the matrix, we actually just had a formula for conservation of energy for cell two in the mesh. And that was the original form of the equation we had. We had APTP plus a summation of all those extra neighbor terms, which we had is equal to BP, the source term on the right hand side. And after we applied implicit relaxation, we moved this dashed line down so that we're moving directly to the new calculated value. And the way that we do that is actually by solving this relaxed equation, so a slightly different equation. And when you compare them next to each other, you can see that actually the equations are quite similar. You've still got the, the summation is still the same on the left-hand side. BP is still the same on the right-hand side, but we've changed the coefficient here of TP, and we've also got this extra term on the right-hand side as well. And what you may know from previous experience, or you may have heard from different sources, but this relaxed equation is more stable than the original equation. When we move along this dashed line here, rather than moving along the original line, this equation is more likely to converge. It's less likely to diverge than the original one. Why is that? So let's look in a bit more detail at this comparison between the original equation and the relaxed one, and let's actually home in. And when we really focus on it, there are in fact only two differences between these two equations. This coefficient AP, you'll remember that this was the diagonal coefficient of the A matrix. This is now AP divided by alpha. 
So it's the exact same value, but we've just divided by the relaxation factor. And on the right hand side, we've still got BP, this will be in the source term, but we've just added this extra term here. And you may remember from uh, the part one of the talk that alpha is just an arbitrary value that is left over to the user, and we could take any value between zero and one for alpha. But what effect does this have? Because we, we had an idea last week about what would happen if we change the value of alpha in the explicit relaxation, but what effect does it have in the implicit relaxation? Well, in order to understand what effect this has, we actually need to go all the way back now to our matrix form. And the way that we're gonna do that is just by reassembling the matrix from the individual rows uh, in, the, in the matrix equation. So you remember that this original form, this is just a single row in the matrix, and the relaxed form is also a single row in the matrix. And what we're gonna do is just write out a few different rows of the matrix because it makes it easier for us to assemble it back together. And so if we do this for the relaxed equation for cell one, we just write out all the terms. AP is equal to A11, if we're looking at the first uh, cell in the matrix. And then the neighbor terms, we've got T2, T3, and T4 there. And then our source term is B1, because it's the B, the source for a cell one. And then this extra source term is A11 multiplied by T1 old. So that's the previous temperature in cell one. And we can do the same thing for cell two, where again, we've got A22, that's the diagonal coefficient over alpha. And then we've got the neighbor terms for cell two, which are T1, T3, and T4 this time. And then on the right-hand side, the source term is B2, source term for cell two, and then A22 multiplied by the previous temperature in cell two. And you could just go through and write these equations out for all four cells in the matrix. And what you can then do is easily just assemble the original matrix back together again. And on the slide here, I've got a side-by-side -side comparison of the original matrix and the relaxed matrix, or the modified matrix. And this original matrix was conservation of energy for the four cells in the mesh. And this was the uh, unstable equation that we wanted to artificially stabilize in some way. And the relaxed form still represents conservation of energy for all four cells in the mesh. But we can really see the differences now that we've written things out in matrix form. We've done something to the diagonal coefficient and we've added this extra source term to the right hand side. And what you'll remember is that generally in CFD, we always use under relaxation. So alpha is always going to be less than or equal to one. And what you can see from that diagonal coefficient is that as you make alpha smaller and smaller, so you reduce it, reduce it from one to 0 0.9 to 0 0.8, all the way down to 0.1, this diagonal term is just going to get larger and larger. Now, what effect does this have? We're just, we're artificially increasing the magnitude of this diagonal coefficient here, because remember, uh, when we're writing a CFD code, we have no control over what value of alpha the user is going to pick. The user gets to pick this when they set up their calculation. They may choose 0.9 or they may choose 0.1 or they may even choose 0.01. So actually this diagonal coefficient could get very large. We actually don't know how large it's going to get. And what actually happens is that as the magnitude of this diagonal coefficient increases, what happens is that the diagonal dominance of the A matrix overall increases. Now, you may have heard this phrase diagonal dominance before if you've looked in the CFD literature, or you may never have heard of it before. It's a, it's a mathematical term that describes a property of the, of the four by four square matrix itself. And what it means is a matrix is diagonally dominant if the magnitude of the coefficient on the diagonal is greater than the other coefficients on that row of the matrix. So for this four by four matrix, if we just, if we look and check, in the first row, the diagonal coefficient is a four, and four is greater than one plus zero plus zero. So row one, we, we looks like we're diagonally dominant. If we now look at row two, the diagonal coefficient is four, and four is greater than two plus one plus zero. And we could do the same for the third row and the fourth row. And so for this matrix, all of the rows, the diagonal coefficient is greater than the sum of the entries on the row. And so that means we do have a diagonally dominant A matrix here.
Now, why does diagonal dominance increase the stability of the matrix equation itself? It turns out this is actually quite a detailed uh, mathematical question to answer. And if you look in the literature, you can find detailed explanations of why increasing the diagonal dominance will increase the stability of the matrix equation. But actually for us as CFD engineers and scientists, it's actually not essential for us to understand why. The main observation for us that we need to make is that as the magnitude of that of the diagonal entries on the matrix uh, get larger and they increase, the matrix itself becomes more stable. And so just a back-to-back -back comparison, for example, uh, equation 17 and equation 18, you can see that in equation 18, these diagonal coefficients are much larger than they are in equation 17. So this is what would happen if the user had a relaxation coefficient of uh, 0.9, say, and they then reduced it down to 0.7. That diagonal uh, of the matrix would then increase, which would make the matrix equation more stable. And that's the effect that we wanted. If you remember back to the start of the talk, we applied implicit relaxation because we wanted to improve the stability of the matrix equation. Now, of course, some of you will also have noticed that uh, in addition to increasing the magnitude of the diagonal term, when we uh, reduce the value of alpha, we also increase the source term on the right hand side there. If I flip back a few slides, you can see that in the matrix form here, that with alpha, as alpha gets smaller, because we have one minus alpha of alpha, this additional source term is going to get larger and larger. So in addition to increasing the diagonal dominance of the A matrix, we're also getting a larger and larger source term. And the effect that that has uh, on the equations, of course, is it acts to slow down the calculation because that source term has T old in it. And T old is the previous, uh, is the previous solution that we calculated during the last iteration. So as the source term goes up, uh, our solution tends more and more to that old value uh, of temperature that we calculated from the last solution, and this is what slows the calculation down. You may also notice as well that the source term is increasing in all of the cells in the mesh, not just in one or two. And so that means that increasing the source term doesn't necessarily have as much of an effect on the stability of the equations as the A matrix, because it's large differences in source terms that often lead to instability in CFD equations. If you have a large force in one cell in a particular cell in the mesh, and then a small source right next to it, that difference in force is actually what causes the difficulties for convergence of the solver. Now, before moving on and finishing off the talk, I just want to spend a, just a brief few minutes just talking about the history of implicit relaxation because it will help you to understand how it's implemented in a lot of the modern day codes. And implicit relaxation in CFD is actually a, a relatively new mathematical technique in the, in the grand scheme of uh, mathematics. And it was first proposed by Patanka in 1980 uh, in his favorite book, in his famous book on the simple algorithm. And if you happen to have that famous book, uh, the equation that you're looking for on the derivation is on page 67. And of course, if you're interested in getting it, I'll just leave a link below to the book if you're interested in picking it up. Um, but for this talk, yeah, implicit relaxation was proposed all the way back in 1980. And the reason it was proposed in 1980 is because the, the momentum equations themselves were found to be quite non-linear and difficult to solve. And actually implicit relaxation was needed in the simple algorithm to actually help uh, the algorithms converge at all. So it was introduced sort of by necessity back in the 1980s. But people quickly realized, of course, that this technique of relaxing a matrix equation, you don't necessarily have to apply it to the, the energy equation for temperature or to the momentum equation. You can actually use this exact same technique and apply it to any matrix equation of the form AX equals B. And of course, in a CFD code, we solve many of these equations. And this is why in some modern CFD codes like OpenFOAM, you actually have the option of applying relaxation to any of the matrices you want. And just as a quick example in OpenFOAM, if you look at the FV solutions file in your uh, most up-to-date version of OpenFOAM, 
Of course, the, the notation may be slightly different because OpenFoam does change from version to version. But in some of the newer versions, what you'll see is that relaxation factors can be applied to fields or to equations. And what this actually means, translated into the language of the past two lecture talks that I've given, is relaxation applied to fields is the explicit relaxation that we talked about in part one. So this would be where a particular field, in this case pressure, is calculated. And then after it's been calculated, we apply relaxation to the update of the field uh, using the formula you see there. Whereas the entry for equations is actually where we use implicit relaxation applied to the matrix equation itself. And for this particular entry that I've taken out of the FV solutions file, you can see that the implicit relaxation is applied to the U equation. It's also applied to the K, omega and epsilon equations as well. So all of those equations will have their uh, diagonal coefficient increased by uh, the relaxation factor alpha there. And then also they're gonna have that additional source term on the right hand side. So what effect does implicit relaxation have on the converged or final steady state solution? We saw from explicit relaxation that once the solution is converged, uh, relaxation has no effect on the solution. Uh, and that's the reason why you can actually choose any relaxation factor you want. It's going to change the intermediate solutions in the solution process, but not the final solution when the algorithm's converged. And so just as a quick check, let's take that relax, the relaxed uh, matrix equation that we have there. And what happens when the algorithms converged, of course, is that T old will be equal to TP. So the, the calculated value will be equal to the previous value because there's no change or well, the change will be very small. And if we just substitute uh, T, TP in for T old here and then do some rearranging, we go from equation 22 down to equation 23. And what you'll notice is that that is the original equation that we had at the start of the talk. So when our algorithm has converged, the value that we choose for alpha is actually going to have no effect on our final steady state solution because we return to the original steady state conservation of energy uh, equation there for the cells in the bar. So in the same manner as explicit relaxation, implicit relaxation also doesn't have an effect on the converged solution. And I like to think of this graphically, and I'm sure some others of you will want to as well. When we're fully converged and there's no change from iteration to iteration, the gradient is zero. So regardless of whether we use explicit relaxation and change the gradient afterwards, or implicit relaxation and change the gradient before, the gradient is still zero, and so the relaxed and the calculated values are identical to the value of the previous iteration. And once again, it is a very important point, so I want to remind you guys again that you should always take care if you're reducing the value of uh, your relaxation factor to a very small value, because you could quite easily be getting a slow divergence or false convergence where your solution may look converged just because it's not changing very much from the small value of alpha, but this could just be disguising a slow divergence. So once again, the same caution there that if you do start changing and playing around with the values of the relaxation factor, you may uh, disguise a false convergence. So be extra careful when you do that in your simulations. So just to wrap up a quick summary here of part two of this uh, lecture series, um, when we're applying implicit relaxation, we're relaxing the matrix equation itself rather than the update to the solution. And implicit relaxation, again, improves the stability of the calculation, and it does this by increasing the diagonal dominance of the A matrix. So those are the, the diagonal terms are greater than the values on the individual rows of the matrix equation. And this technique of implicit relaxation was originally proposed back in the 1980s for the momentum equation in the simple algorithm. But of course, we can apply it to any matrix equation that we solve uh, in the CFD code. And that's why uh, in some CFD codes like OpenFoam, you actually have the option of applying relaxation to equations as well as to field values. So that brings me to the end of part two of my lecture series on relaxation in CFD.
I'm really hoping that by the end of this series, you've now got a good grasp of what the difference is between explicit relaxation or relaxation of field values and implicit relaxation or relaxation of equations. Now in part three of this lecture series, so the next talk, I'm going to be moving on to explain actually what relaxation of steady state calculations actually means and how it relates to pseudo transient and full transient simulations. The next talk is really fantastic and you're going to learn a lot from it. It's going to change the whole way that you look at steady state calculations in CFD. So I'm really looking forward to bringing you that talk. Um, until then, once again, if you have any comments, leave them in the comments section. Uh, I really look forward to hearing from you. How are you finding this lecture series? Is it helping you to understand actually what happens when you change the value of your relaxation factors uh, in your CFD calculations? So please let me know in the comments section. I always like hearing your comments from you. Uh, and until next time, thank you all very much for continuing to support the channel. I really appreciate it. Uh, see you next time.